All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So for announcements, don't forget homework four is due this Friday. That is posted on Canvas, as well as the due time and the due date. Lab five is in progress now. We'll actually start lab six this week. Um, that will be a two week lab. And you're going to build some uh, sensor circuits on your breadboard and get that all working. Do some soldering for the temperature sensor. So we will start that this week. So for lecture, during the last class, we covered MOSFET power dissipation. We talked about thermal considerations, the heat flow from silicon devices like MOSFETs, from junction to case to heat sinks. And, uh, and so we, we covered that. And today we're going to talk about a couple other MOSFET practical considerations, specifically in the circuit. I'll show you that. We're going to talk about gate resistors and, and diodes in inductive circuits. And I think that'll add some, again, kind of more practical tools to your toolbox. So when you want to use MOSFETs, you'll be able to do that without having problems with your circuit. We're also going to get into DC to DC conversion. Um, talk, we'll talk about linear regulators and switching converters, and then we'll move on to power inverters converting DC to AC. So we're going to try to finish up the power sources and control section of the course and then move on to the next milestone uh, next class. All right. And again, if you have any questions during class, shout out your questions or shoot them out in the chat. All right, so we're finishing up on MOSFETs, and we're going to talk about uh, gate resistors and uh, two, two resistors that you usually use on the gate of a MOSFET. So this will keep you out of trouble from overdriving or, or re requiring too much current from a digital control circuit, and also uh, have you turn your load off. When you want to turn a load off, it'll turn off um, responsively instead of having a, a delay because of an open circuit. So MOSFETs typically have in, in circuits, and I'm talking about power MOSFETs. There are other MOSFETs we'll talk about um, in a minute, but um, I'm talking about like the power MOSFETs you're using in lab and you've seen these two resistors in the schematic and you, you put those in your circuit. And I wanted to talk about those to show you what they do. So there's a, a series resistor, this R sub G, this gate resistor, okay? And this is there because the gate interface looks like a capacitor. So inside the MOSFET, we talked about the gate has a, a metal layer, then an oxide insulator layer, and then finally the semiconductor material. And you have an insulator uh, that forms a capacitor with the conductors on, on each side. Okay, and so if you have a capacitor, then that capacitor behaves as I is equal to C dV dt. Right? So the current is going to be the capacitance times the derivative of voltage applied to that, to that gate. Um, and so without that gate resistor, if you have a sharp gate voltage appearing between gate to source, um, that causes a large DVDT, and that could cause a large current from whatever is providing that control voltage, like your microcontroller. Okay, so that gate resistor actually limits the, the maximum control current from the microcontroller or other input device something that's providing that control voltage. Um, and it causes VGS to be an, an exponential change. Okay. So, you know, in theory, if you had a, a, an infinite slope rise of VGS, you would require infinite current from whatever the control source is. Nothing can provide infinite current, but you're requiring a lot of current for a very short period of time. And so on some digital outputs, that could cause a problem. It could cause... Um, uh, maybe blowing out the output stage, it could cause glitches in that digital circuit. So that's what that R sub G is for. Now, that's what it does. That's good. What's not so good is while limiting current, uh, you get an RC response. You get an exponential change because of that RC circuit, RG with the, the gate capacitance. 
Um, and that causes the moss fat to stay in the saturation region longer if you have a larger RG. We took a look at this last time that, that when that transition of the gate voltage, gate to source voltage isn't very sharp, you remain in the saturation region, um, you get a non-zero V or non-zero I, and you're, you, have, you have power dissipated uh, in the MOSFET. So, so it's not too good to have a large RG. You want some reasonable value. So what is the reasonable value? For example, in your, for your project, I calculated an RG that was uh, a value that limited the current from the microcontroller, the Arduino, to a couple of milliamps, a few milliamps, okay? Because I think the, um, you know, the, the Arduino has an output of actually a few tens of milliamps maximum, but I didn't want to be drawing a lot of current out of that output stage. So I calculated RG knowing the gate capacitance from the data sheet and figured out, well, um, if I have I is equal to C dV dt um, and I have uh, some kind of uh, infinite change, right? What, what not infinite change, but but if I have a let's say five volts on the left, zero volts on the right, how do I limit the uh, current out of the microcontroller to a few milliamps? And that's how I calculated. I think it was 270 ohms for your series resistance with the gate. Okay, there's another resistor here, this pull down resistor, and the purpose of that resistor uh, is to bring the gate to source voltage to zero if you disconnect the control voltage, or if for some reason your digital output goes to an high, a high impedance value, because you do have charge stored in this gate to source capacitance that can keep your load operating at some level if you just leave the gate voltage open. So this pull down is there to discharge uh, any capacitance, either the gate capacitance or other capacitance on this on this line so that the load turns off when you intend the load to turn off by setting VGS to either zero or a high impedance value, okay? Um, otherwise, your load might run for a while. So also notice here, some, some people get this, get this wrong. The, the pull down resistor is on the left side or the, the, the opposite side of that gate resistor from the gate. And that's so you don't get a voltage divider formed between RG and ground. If you put R pull down on the other side of RG, then you formed a voltage divider uh, providing voltage uh, to VG, the gate, that is the output of a voltage divider. So you might get a lower voltage, a lower threshold voltage. That's also not good for power efficiency. So the lesson here is don't just go connect a voltage to a gate in a MOSFET control circuit, consider putting these resistors in the circuit. Uh, you'll get better behavior. So in the chat, if a pull down resistor is for dissipating the capacitance in the gate, what would the use case for a pull up resistor be? Ah, that's good. So a pull up resistor is used when you want, I'll say, the default condition of a voltage to be high, and you ground that node to go low. If you go back and look at the slide that I put together on on uh, on how to take a switch input and apply it to a microcontroller, I used a pull-up resistor there. The pull-up resistor holds that node um, that goes to the microcontroller at a high value logic high until you close the switch and then that node gets pulled low. So in this case, you want to pull down resistor because I want, if, if I disconnect the control voltage, the um, resistance nat naturally, or the uh, voltage naturally goes low. Okay. And I think we'll look at, I'll point out when we get to some more circuits, what, um, where pull ups and pull downs are used in those circuits. Okay, another important circuit element in a MOSFET circuit, especially when you have an inductive load, is a flyback diode. Okay, so motors, as we talked about in class and in lab, 
they are inductive loads. They have coils of wire. And so they operate um, like an inductor intentionally or un I guess intentionally because you want the magnetic field to sp spin the motor. But for an inductor, the voltage across an inductance is L D I D T. So if you change current rapidly, right, a steep slope, you're going to get a large voltage. The, the magnetic field formed through that coil collapses and causes an induced voltage. Okay, and if that magnetic field collapses rapidly or you shut the current off rapidly, you're going to cause a very large voltage, much larger than any power supply voltage possibly that you have in the circuit. So, well, that's the whole point of the MOSFET when you're, when you're uh, implementing pulse width modulation, it's to turn the current on and off rapidly. And so, what you what you wind up getting is a um, a voltage spike across the motor. So that motor voltage, if you have current flowing down through this motor, and the polarity is as shown, if you try to shut off that current rapidly with the MOSFET, the magnetic field collapses around that inductor inductance, that coil of wire, and and that uh, Lenz's law says that the inductance is going to try to keep the current flowing. It's going to oppose the change of current. That will cause a big negative voltage across this motor here. Okay, and that could damage the MOSFET or it could damage anything else possibly connected to that, that power supply circuit. So what we do is we put a normally reverse, di uh, reverse bias diode across the motor. And so when you look at this diode at first without considering the inductance problem. It looks like that diode does nothing. You have maybe a positive supply voltage here and current's trying to flow from positive supply to ground. And this diode is reverse biased. Well, when that voltage um, across the motor goes negative because of the inductance, well, then current wants to flow the other way. So it wants to flow through that diode up through that diode in the forward biased direction. And what that diode does is before that voltage can get too high, it starts conducting. And so the voltage can never get very high. And there's not a whole lot of energy stored in most motors or most inductances. So the, the, the diode doesn't, doesn't have to dissipate a lot of energy, um, but it does a good job of starting to conduct the current, has a voltage across it. That means it is dissipating power. And that's where the energy goes from that magnetic field. Okay, often a shot key diode is used versus a silicon PN junction diode because shot key diodes have a lower forward voltage. So if, um, if you took any electronics class, circuits class, or my class, we talked about PN junctions and how a typical silicon diode has roughly forward voltage of 0.7 volts, you know, 0.6 to 0.8, somewhere in there, depending upon the current level. Um, shot key diodes have a forward voltage of like 0.1 to less than about 0.5 volts, depending upon the current where you're defining the forward voltage. And so they're, they're different. They're different. They're not just PN junctions, they're actually a metal semiconductor junction that have a lower um, lower forward voltage. And so why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't you use shot key diodes all the time? Well, there are disadvantages. Um, they have lower reverse voltage ratings um, and larger reverse current leakage. So there's, there are pluses and minuses. In this application, we don't have a big reverse uh, voltage, so the diode's not going to get damaged. Um, we don't really care about the small leakage current in this case, so a shot key diode does a good job of keeping that that voltage spike suppressed to a low value. You will hear many names for a diode that is connected across an inductance. Uh, you'll hear flyback diode, snubber diode, commutating diode, freewheeling diode, suppressor diode, clamp diode, or catch diode. If you hear any of those terms, it's usually a diode that is placed across an inductance to snub, to dissipate that, that voltage spike that happens um, when you try to change the current rapidly, usually turning it off.
So I usually call this a flyback diode or a snubber diode. I've you know, occasionally heard the other terms. Okay. <clears throat> so those are two uh, important circuit considerations when you're using MOSFETs, uh, those gate resistors, and this diode if you're using an inductive load to protect the MOSFET, protect other devices in the circuit. Okay. So that finishes up our discussion on, on MOSFETs. Just to review, MOSFETs are used to control current. MOSFETs are good at controlling a high uh, amount of current, large current values in the you know, tens of amps at least. And But you have to consider the, the thermal power, the, the, the heat generation, uh, the thermal loss that that MOSFET has to handle. Right? So you might have to heat sink that MOSFET when controlling high currents. And when you use MOSFETs, consider these two circuit considerations, the resistors and the diode uh, for an inductive load. All right, so I think that should set you up for being able to use MOSFETs in the future and reading MOSFET data sheets and characteristic curves. So let's change the topic a little bit to an application that uh, sometimes, often, I should say, uses MOSFETs. Let's talk about DC voltage conversion and voltage regulation. All right, so DC voltage conversion and regulation are ways to power a load from a source that has a different voltage. So if you have a source that is of some voltage, and you have a load that needs another voltage, then you need some kind of DC voltage conversion. In fact, the source's voltage might, might change over time, right? If it's a battery discharging, then the source voltage falls. Uh, the load requirement for power or current might change over time as well. If you have a motor that is supplying a, a certain load and that load changes, then you need a different amount of power delivered from the source. Um, if you have a, 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 a phone or a transmitter or any kind of device that sits in standby and then goes into operational mode, then the, the current requirement changes for that load. The voltage requirement might stay the same, but the current changes so that the load can have more power. So you need some kind of conversion and regulation. So DC conversion usually refers to um, the change from the, a source voltage, nominal source voltage, to a higher or lower lo load voltage. You know, you, you might have some load that operates off of five volts, and then you might have a nine volt source, or you might have a three volt source. So this voltage conversion can convert to a higher or a lower voltage. That's, that's what we need. And then the regulation part of it uh, refers to maintaining a constant voltage, even if the the, the, either the source voltage changes or the load current or load power requirement changes. So we're talking about DC voltage conversion. Um, you're probably familiar with AC voltage conversion using a transformer. So we're not gonna dig deep into transformers, but I will mention that um, transformers work by coupling the magnetic field from one coil to another. So you can, you can induce a magnetic field in a coil and, and have a changing magnetic field um, from an AC current generated from that first coil. And then the coil here on the right, the secondary coil, um, has that magnetic field going through it. And that change of a magnetic field through that secondary coil causes uh, a voltage to be induced. And that's basically how a transformer works. And you can step up or step down AC voltages using a turns ratio. So if you have a a 10 to one turns ratio, primary to secondary, you'd step the voltage down by 10. If you have a one to 10 turns ratio, you step the voltage up by 10. So if you've seen, if you've ever taken apart a device and you've seen transformers, maybe in a power supply that look like this, that's, that's what the transformer is doing. It's converting AC voltage from one level to another. Or if you look up at a power line, you'll see these cylindrical boxes, boxes, cases, enclosures. Um, and, and they're actually meant to step down the voltage 
for ones that look like this from the higher voltage lines that are running along the poles down to 120 volts that go to your house. And also they actually generate a split phase, two different phases that go to your house. So you can have 120 and 240 in your house. Um, so, but for uh, devices we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about DC voltage conversion. So instead of using kind of a, a simple coupled coil, DC voltage conversion requires uh, a more complicated circuit. And it uses either switching or feedback control or both. So the DC to DC converter that you have in lab looks like this. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but that's that's a switching converter. Okay, and so there are different types of conversion approaches. And you select the type of approach based on, well, what kind of power efficiency are you looking for? Are you looking for a low noise power conversion approach? Um, do you have lots of space or very com confined space, um, right? Consider size, weight, power, and cost in your decision. Okay, so the two approaches I'm going to talk about are linear voltage regulators and uh, switcher converters or switcher regulators. So the linear regulator uses what's called a pass element. It's a transistor. It can be a MOSFET to, con to control or cause a voltage drop between the source and the load. So you can go from a, um, a high, voltage, uh, high voltage to a lower voltage. But this results in poor power efficiency for large differences between the source and the load voltage. Okay, so that's the downside. Uh, but linear regulators are small. They're available in really small surface mount devices, and you just put a couple other components around them, and they work. Switcher converters or switching converters, they rapidly switch a transistor or a pass element um, and use an inductor and capacitor usually to decrease or increase the voltage. So you can you can step uh, you can step up in voltage or you can step down in voltage. Linear regulators only go down in voltage. And the switcher converters have really good power efficiency usually because of using switching versus a voltage drop across an element. Remember a, a class or two ago. I showed you pulse width modulation versus analog control of a MOSFET. And you know the analog control that caused a big voltage drop across the MOSFET, that was really inefficient. Well, that's what a linear regulator is doing. Um, and if you're using something like pulse width modulation, turning the, the, uh, the pass element on and off MOSFET, then, then you can get really good efficiency. So that's a benefit benefit of a switcher. So why not always use switchers? Because they're typically larger in size, they're a more complicated circuit, and they generate noise. Okay, so there's a trade here to do. All right. Okay, so let's first start talking about linear regulators, and then we'll talk about switcher converters. Again, there's a, there's a place for each of these. So linear regulators, they use a feedback loop and they adjust a voltage drop um, using the pass element. So on the left here, here's the source. And the source has a higher voltage than the load requires. Okay. And so there's a, there's a pass element here and it causes, here it's drawn as a MOSFET, it causes a voltage drop. So you have some current going from source uh, to load and then this voltage drop Vx. And then there's, there's a control loop that adjusts that voltage drop to minimize the error between the measured load voltage, this output voltage, and the desired load voltage. Okay, so that's, um, that's how this works. So if we look at this, you can see the feedback loop. Right? So there's a, there's a controlling ele controlled element here, and then we're sensing a voltage. We're going through this op amp, and then we, we're, we're doing some, some kind of control uh, to apply voltage to that pass element. So what's really happening here 
is you have an output voltage that you desire, maybe five volts. And then this reference voltage internal to the linear voltage regulator might be set at one volt, something like that. So this voltage divider inside the voltage regulator is dividing down that five volts to one volt. Okay. And then it's going into this op amp. And this is sort of like a feedback. It's exactly like a feedback loop that we talked about in the intro to circuits class where the, the, this, this, this uh, feedback path is going to drive the input differential voltage of this op amp to zero. Okay, so, so what's, what's going to happen is this op amp's output voltage is going to change until V ref equals this output of the voltage divider. Okay, and so that's how it maintains um, the output voltage. So if the output, if the load tries to draw more power from the source, typically the output voltage will fall. That will cause um, this op amp to increase the voltage to the pass element and let more current through. Okay, so there's a feedback loop going on here. In fact, there are some linear voltage regulators that say, okay, you apply an external resistor here and, um, and then you can control the voltage to exactly what you want, you know, 3.82 volts or whatever. Some linear regulators come in specified voltages, like a five volt regulator, a 3.3 voltage a volt regulator, a six volt regulator, but there are adjustable ones. Okay, so that's how it works. There's a feedback loop, a pass element. Um, v source needs to be higher than V load. Okay. Um, and in fact, the pass element has a non zero voltage and non zero current. So V source cannot be too close to V load. Like you can't have, let's say, a five volt output and a 5.001 volt input because this pass element has a minimum voltage across it. Let's call it the dropout voltage. So if you see a dropout voltage specified, um, that's what that is. In fact, the um, there are linear regulators available that are called LDOs, low dropout voltage regulators that allow really small voltages um, between input and output. And those are more efficient because the pass element has a non-zero voltage and a non-zero current and power is I times V. So I times V up here, right? I times V is the power dissipation of that MOSFET of this voltage regulator. So you get power dissipated. And so the power efficiency is really low if you have a big V source and a small V load relative. Like if V source is a lot higher than V load, you'll have a, a low power efficiency. Okay. Um, but you know, maybe you don't care. Maybe the maybe the current through the linear regulator is so low, you don't really care. Uh, then even though the power efficiency is low, maybe it's a milliwatt dissipated. So you might not care. So there's a um, there's lots of different packages for linear regulators. Here is a here are a few examples. This is a really small surface mount regulator. Um, here's a an IC regulator. Here's a a regulator that looks like your MOSFET, but it has this all built into it. Um, you notice there so there are typically three pins on a linear voltage regulator. Some regulators have features like an enable or a disable. So you can you can turn on or turn off the power with an enable pin. So you'll see that. Okay. And then typically you use decoupling capacitors on the input and the output for two reasons. One, we talked about reducing noise on DC power supply nodes. Okay, so that's what those capacitors do. But sometimes capacitance is required to keep this loop stable and not oscillate. So you got to look at the data sheet. So when you're, when you're building one of these, you've got to consider what the data sheet says about a capacitance range at the input and the output. Right. Um, and, and sometimes, let's suppose you need a big uh, drop of voltage from a 12 volt source to a five volt load. What you can do is you can you can use a linear regulator after a switching regulator. So the switching regulator is kind of noisy, and if it's too noisy, you can drop 
the voltage from, let's say, 12 volts to 5.5 volts, and then finally go 5.5 volts to 5 volts with a linear regulator, that will give you um, a lower noise conversion. All right. Okay, so another approach to DC to DC conversion is uh, uh, switching converters. And so let's talk about what's called a boost mode converter first. Boost means step up. So when you see boost converter, it means you're going from a lower voltage to a higher voltage. So this will um, increase the load voltage compared to the source voltage. So they work like this. So here, here's a source on the left, a load on the right, and between those four terminals, dots, circles, that is the drawing of a, a boost converter. And so this, this switch in here, which is shown in the closed position, um, it's actually one MOSFET or more MOSFETs, depending upon the architecture. But that's it's an electronically controlled switch transistor. All right. OK, so let's walk through this and see how this works. Let's talk about, great, I have a source, I have a load, I turn on the source, and the switch is closed. What happens? OK. So, so the switch connects the inductor to the source voltage so that the inductor voltage equals the source voltage. And so, so look at this. Like when I turn the source on, the switch is closed. I'm actually connecting that inductor directly across a DC source. And um, you know, if you've learned in, in in circuits class or you took my class, this is a really bad idea to connect a an inductor for any period of time across a DC source because the current will climb really high. Probably the inductor will burn out or the the source will reach its maximum power output. One of those is going to happen. Uh, but we're, what we're going to do is before that inductor can burn out, we're going to open up this switch. So this is just for a short period of time. All right, so what happens is current flows. So the inductor's current increases, and it's a ramp function. V equals L di dt. So I is the integral of V. V is a constant. So I L ramps up linearly. OK, so that happens. Um, and well, what if there was a, a voltage on the right side of this diode because that capacitor was charged? They'll see this capacitor is going to charge up. Well, that's what that diode does. Diode blocks any current from flowing from a charged capacitor on the right um, through that shorted switch on the left. OK, so that's what the diode's there for. OK, so this the magnetic field is building up uh, around that inductor. The current is increasing. And any charge that was stored in that capacitor is being discharged through the load. OK, let's move forward five cycles of this whole process. So the capacitor is discharging through the load. That capacitor's voltage is, is discharging, is going down as, as it feeds the load with energy. OK, so that happens when the switch is closed. And then at some period, short time later, the switch is opened. OK, so what happens when we open the switch? So when we open the switch, um, a couple things happen. Well, one, the source current or the energy supplied by the source can flow through the inductor, through the diode, through the load. Okay. Uh, but let's look at this inductor. So that inductor magnetic field induces a voltage that keeps the current flowing. Right. That that magnetic field's collapsing. So actually, VL wants to become a negative voltage to keep the current flowing through itself. OK, so current's going to flow through the diode. The diode allows current to flow in the forward direction. OK, and so what that does is that supplies current to charge this capacitor and to power the load. Right. And so if you look at the load voltage, we do a KVL equation here. Right, The load voltage is equal to the source voltage minus VL with that polarity, minus VD with that polarity. OK. And I mentioned that um, this is probably something like a shot key diode. So the, the diode voltage is small, right? It might be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volts, something like that. Uh, but that 
inductor voltage is negative. So we have V source minus VL. Well, that's a negative value VL. So it's really V source plus some value. Okay, so V load is greater than V source. So that's how we get the step up in voltage. That inductor, the voltage across that inductor that's induced by the collapsing magnetic field is what is, is adding to the source voltage and causing the load voltage to be bigger. Okay, so we, we keep doing this. You open and close the switch. And depending upon the frequency and duty cycle of opening and closing that switch, you can control the voltage across the load. And that capacitor smooths out uh, this, this switching function, okay? Because a capacitor is a low impedance for high frequency signals. So this looks like a short, not really, it's just a low impedance to high frequency signals. So the load mostly looks like a DC voltage. Well, except there's some noise, right? Since the capacitor is not exactly a short, it doesn't look like a wire to high frequencies. Um, uh, there, there is some noise that gets through to the load from this switching operation. Okay, so the duty cycle of the switch controls that load voltage. Um, and this on-off switching versus that pass element have a, having a you know, finite voltage across it, the on-off switching function makes the converter more efficient than a linear voltage regulator, right? But that on-off switching causes voltage ripple and in general noise in the load voltage, okay? So that's, that's how a DC to DC converter works. This is, let's see, this is a boost. This is stepping up. I'll show you a buck converter, which is a step down, which is what you're using in lab. But before I do that, any questions on this process here? I have a question when the um when the switch is then again shut does the load voltage go back down to the v the voltage across the capacitor it does so so when the so when the switch is open the capacitor and the load have the same voltage across them right so the so when the switch is that's when the switch is open when this when the switch closes um that capacitor discharges. And so the capacitor's voltage falls, which means the load voltage falls. And that's exactly what causes this ripple and causes this noise. Okay, okay, thanks. But what you, what you do is you, you have the frequency high enough so the voltage can't fall too much, right? You might have it fall, you know, 20 millivolts right. or something like that. Because mm -hmm. there's a time element to the capacitors so that's, you can like, you can allow the, the source voltage to open up to whatever it needs to. That, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you, and you have, you know, if this load is a resistor, let's say you have an RC time constant decay. So you can, you can figure out if, again, if it's a resistive load, how long you can let the capacitor run the circuit um, before the voltage falls too much. And then you have to have another charging cycle of that capacitor before it falls too low. And if you were to, I guess, um, try and tune this, you, you would just choose a larger inductor in order to charge up quickly enough or quicker? Yeah, there's a whole method to that. So if you look at, um, an, like an in, there are integrated circuits that have much of these functions built in. And depending upon the frequency you choose and the ripple you're looking for and the voltage conversion levels that you're looking for, th th there's, there's a process to calculate that. And so there's a certain inductor size you want to choose and a certain capacitor size you want to choose for a given ripple and a given frequency and a given duty cycle range. Is, so it's like parameter matching at that point? Um, it's, or parameter tuning, maybe? It's, it's tuning, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure. I have another question, if you don't mind. Go ahead. What controls the MOSFET switching? Mm -hmm. There's a controller. There's an oscillator in the uh, in the integrated circuit. So usually again, this is built into like an integrated circuit. So if you're if you're using an IC from a manufacturer, it has an oscillator and a feedback loop and uh, a controller in there adjusting the pulse width modulation. And um, and so uh, and I'll, I'll show you an example of one. Or if you're building your own, let's suppose you take your own, you're, you know, you're building something special 
you want to use a microcontroller to do this, you'd have to have some kind of feedback loop to a microcontroller sensing the load voltage, whether you have to increase or decrease the, the, the PWM of that switch um, and of the MOSFET, and then you would control it with a microcontroller. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at other switching converter topologies. You know, for example, here's a buck converter. A buck converter is a step down converter, so a higher voltage down to a lower voltage. And I'm not going to walk through the whole process, but you can see uh, what this diagram does show. This is out of an application note that's um, posted on the website on Canvas. So you can see that when the switch is closed, so first you can see that the components are arranged differently, right? You have a series switch, not a parallel switch. The inductor is is in line with the um, with the load. You have the diode over here, a shunt diode here. And so when the switch S1 is closed, you get the current flow through the inductor. So it's building up the magnetic field in the inductor. It's, it's charging the capacitor and it's serving current through the load. And then when the switch um, opens up, well, well, now what happens, right? You have current flowing this way from the um, from the inductor, and it keeps flowing. So the inductor's collapsing magnetic field is causing the current to keep flowing through the uh, through the load. Okay, so that's a step down process. There's a buck boost converter, so you can start at one voltage and go up or go down. And so here's a way to do that. The trick here is this is an inverting converter, so the output is going to be the negative of the input, right? So that's that's a catch with this converter. But you can see the paths um, taken here. You have a capacitor and an inductor and a switch configured in a different way. Here's a two-stage buck boost uh, single-ended primary inductor converter, SEPIC converter. And so you have a couple inductors and a couple capacitors. And I'll let you stare at this for a while to see what happens when the switch opens and the switch closes, okay? But you can step up or step down and not invert the voltage on the output, okay? And each one of these, so why wouldn't you always use a two-stage buck boost converter? Because there's there are different advantages and dis there are trades here. And so some of the, some of the converters will work well. Uh, uh, they have higher efficiencies or they work better when you have um, um, either farther spread source voltage and load voltage, or they're closer together. And if they're close together, you probably want to use a linear regulator. Um, there's also, some of these can also go unstable on you if you uh, get out of range too far with your PWM or with your load and source values. So each topology has its own function, its advantages, disadvantages, its complexity, resonances, ripple currents, ripple voltages. So we're not going to go into that, but you can, you know, if you're interested in, oh, I, I just need to step up, you probably just want a boost converter, um, not a buck boost converter, because you, there are some disadvantages that come with the added capabilities. Okay. So the resonances can lead to instability. Yeah, I saw, I saw that in the chat. And also the resonances can cause spikes, frequency spikes in your your DC voltage output. Okay, so you and if you have let's say like a radio receiver, you might get tones being received that are generated by the by the power supply. So this is the this is the um, converter you have in lab. Right? This is the board you put on your project. And so this is a, a an integrated circuit, an LM2596. Okay, it is a um, it is a buck converter. It steps down because you're stepping down from about six volts to about 1.5 volts. And here is the application note, or here's the application diagram out of the data sheet. <clears throat> okay, and so you can see here's the device right here. Right. Then you see the inductor L1. L1 is this surface mount inductor right here. You can see the two capacitors C in, C out. You'll see in, C out over here. Right. So there's the capacitors. We've got a diode. Here's a diode down here. Um, what else? And that 
let's see, I got to think about, here's your adjustment of voltage here. Right? I see a couple of resistors and then a capacitor and then this potentiometer that is adjusting either, probably either R1 or R2 here so that you can adjust the output voltage. Okay. And so, um, so other topologies and DC to DC conversion types exist. There's something called a, a charge pump or a switched capacitor approach um, and, and variations you'll see of buck boost with, again, different advantages, different disadvantages. But what they let you do is take a low DC voltage and step it up or take a high v DC voltage and step it down and do it very efficiently. Like, you know, kind of in the 75 to high 90s percent range of efficiency. Okay. And a lot of times I wouldn't, I wouldn't go, unless I had a very special need, I probably wouldn't go building one of these in a circuit with MOSFETs and inductors and capacitors. I'd probably go look at the available integrated circuits because they'll, they'll put bounds on what will work. And so you'll have guidance out of a data sheet to show you how to get a DC to DC converter to work, not go unstable, not be too inefficient. Okay. All right. Let's try a clicker. Let's, we have enough time for a clicker problem here. Let's talk about linear regulator power efficiency. So the typical efficiency of a DC to DC switching converter, not a linear regulator, is in this kind of 75 to 98% range, uh, range, but you get higher noise, as I mentioned. And so suppose you can't deal with the noise. You need a low noise supply voltage for an automotive application, and you're considering a linear regulator instead. And automotive application, you would expect 12 volts from the 12 volt battery and the device requires five volts at two amps. So 10 Watts, that's not a lot of power. That's something reasonable to get out of your auxiliary connector used to be called cigarette lighter adapter out of your car. Um, so what is the power efficiency of the voltage conversion? So here's a diagram. Let's talk about this a little bit. So here's your linear voltage regulator sources on the left load is on the right. 12 volts on the left, five volts on the right, and the device needs two amps. And so there's this other connection. We didn't really talk about this, but this, you know, inside here was that voltage divider. That's usually a pretty low current, right? There's some current that's required to operate these electronics in here, but it's usually pretty low compared to two amps. So for example, in, in a, an L7805 five volt linear regulator, that quiescent current, that, that current through this ground here is, is six milliamps, really small compared to that two amps. So let's ignore it, okay? And so let's assume that if I have two amps going to the load, I have two amps coming into the voltage regulator, okay? And power efficiency, power efficiency is P out over PN. PN is the power delivered from the source to the linear regulator. P out is delivered from the linear regulator to the, to the load. And so from that, in the 90 seconds or so we have left, what is the power efficiency? Let me start this. Oh, where'd that go here? Let's see here. Something happened here. Well, let's try this. Looks like my clicker thing locked up here. Keep working on that while I get the clicker working. 
Hmm. Wow. Clicker is not working for me, even if I open it up again. So write your answer down somewhere. You don't have to submit this, but I want to give you a chance to answer. So let's take a look at this problem. So uh, PN is IN times VN. So that's 24 watts, 2 amps times 12 volts. P out is 2 amps times 5 volts, so 10 watts out. Power efficiency is 10 over 24, 41%. That means 59%-ish that means is is being the, the power is being burned up in the voltage regulator, right? So the answer is is forty percent. So so that's not too good, right? That's that's a pretty crummy power efficiency. When you're when you're looking at this, right? When you consider the quiescent current is pretty low, um, I in is approximately equal to I out. So the power efficiency is roughly the ratio of voltages. So that's why you can see this This is going to be a pretty bad power efficiency because the input voltage is so much higher than the load voltage, than the output voltage here. So Vn closer to V out is more efficient. Um, uh, but you can't get too close, right? Because y y there's some dropout voltage. There's a minimum Vn minus V out. Depends on the regulator. You can take a look at that in the data sheet. And so what you might do is a hybrid conversion approach where you, where you take... Um, a switching converter, you might down uh, step down from 12 volts to like 5.5 volts and then have a linear regulator uh, from 5.5 volts to 5 volts or, or whatever the whatever the linear regulator can tolerate for a dropout voltage. And what this will do is this will reduce the noise. There still will be higher noise than if you didn't have a switching regulator in there. Um, but the noise will be reduced by what's called the regulator's power supply rejection ratio, which is specified in dB usually. Okay. All right. So I definitely hit the wall on time for today. So if you have any questions about this, uh, stop by at office hours right after class, and I'll start those in just a few seconds. So don't forget that homework four is due this Friday. So submit that um, as instructed on Canvas. Check Canvas for the other uh, due times for lab and um, upcoming homeworks. I'll start office hours in just a few seconds. So if you'd like to join, come on and join. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.